Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to hand you over to, to Michael now. Mm. Um, thank you very much. Connor? Yeah, so what I was thinking of, myself and Connor were thinking of, was rather than make closing remarks as such, um, that maybe I might open this up to a, a, a bit more of a discussion around the whole area of the Dublin Statement and where to next uh, with it. Because I guess, as Connor said, we're all very conscious of moving it from being uh, an event to being something that has a bit more of a longer life than that. So uh, Connor, myself, and uh, uh, Carlana and a group of people, including Sophie, have been kind of talking during the day about how we might kind of progress things a little bit further. So I was thinking of maybe sharing our idea uh, as it stands at the moment and just getting some feedback from yourselves. Will that be okay? So this isn't closing remarks, it's more of a continuation of the discussion. So uh, what we were looking at at the moment is that um, you heard the Minister's statement this morning in the press release that went out where she offered the department's very strong support from a, for a statement coming out of this conference on LGBT young people and social inclusion across Europe. So what we aim to do, and again, you can tell us whether this is the right thing to do, we'll, we'll, we'll be guided by you. We, what we aim to do is, is uh, amend a statement based on your feedback from the workshops today and um, from what we have on the walls outside. And then belong to would work with the Department of Children and Youth Affairs to make an amended version, um, tightened up version of the Dublin Statement. Um, the Department of Children and Youth Affairs would then need to bring it to other government departments, in terms of Irish government departments, to check in with them around it, because obviously there's issues that cross over other government departments in terms of justice and employment and various pieces. And then the idea would be to issue it at the end of the Irish, it would be issued at the end of the Irish uh, EU presidency as essentially a, a, an outcome in, in ways from the Irish presidency, which we would hope would create some level of the political pressure that um, Sophie mentioned before she left. Um, now, there are thoughts on it as it stands. Uh, as it stands at the moment, that seems to me, to me anyway, to maybe be the best use of what we've done today. And I guess I would just like to turn it over to you and see what you, what you think of that idea. Was that too much of a big question? <laughs> Leslie? Hi. Yeah, this, um, I understand where you're coming from with all of the what you're going to do with this after, but this is all based around youth, so would it not be like a good idea to kind of bring it back to youth and say, do you think this may protect you? Do you think this will help you and include you? Sure. So in terms of, of, of practically speaking, you, Leslie, do you mean like building a, a more youth consultation after this point? Yeah, like yeah. I know, like even put it out to a survey, just just bring it into other youth services and be like, okay, do you think this may help you? Or even in schools, like, just, it doesn't have to be a really in-depth thing, just, it might be something to look at, because I know myself, I'm a youth, I suppose, so I sure. just want to be able to give feedback, you know? Sure. Yeah, no, I hear you, absolutely. I think that's a great idea. I will just say one thing, Leslie, sorry, and this is just being really practical, yeah. there, there may be a bit of an issue of time, that's the only thing, just to say, but yeah, absolutely. Oh, oh, yeah, good point, actually. Sorry, Connor just sent me a note here saying that maybe the outcomes from this could also help inform the next round of the structured dialogue process as well, which essentially is consultation with young people across Europe. Yeah, but great point. Thanks, Leslie. Yes? I, I, I just think, uh, agreeing with some of what Leslie said, but also that I feel an obligation uh, as one of the NGO, international NGO representatives here, that I think it's up to us, and just looking to my right, I see three immediately, it's up, up to us to take uh, the outcomes of this and from the Irish presidency in relation to LGBT youth yeah. and use that uh, with the Lithuanian presidency, which, as we've heard, has a very different outlook mm. on what's called a non-Lithuanian uh, idea, this idea of LGBT equality, which seems to be so radical for some reason. So I think it's our obligation as international NGOs to take what this conference has been saying and what the Irish presidency has been working on for the last six months forward with Lithuania and again to Greece and onto Italy and Latvia in the future. And sorry, can I ask you a question while you have the microphone? Would it, would it make sense for, interna for us to be asking international NGOs, or actually not just international, um, other bodies to sign up to this? Would that help in your advocacy? if at the end of this there was a statement that came out that had a number of bodies signed up to it? I would certainly have no problem bringing that back to my, to SU anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Peter? Yeah, I, don't, I think you can hear me. Yeah? yeah. If Angus can hear me over there, then I'm going to shout. Okay, for pro forma reasons. Um, yeah, I think the most important thing is that you have ownership of this statement and people need to know where it came from and what you plan to do with it. So first and foremost, since it came from Belong To and the Irish Ministry in cooperation, 
and you want to feed in from the things from today, then you need to decide, is it a close thing today? And I personally think that is a relevant thing to say. Uh, and then you share it with everyone, and then they use it in different ways, to inform, to create visibility, to decide if they want to sign up to, but you should close it today so there's no more changing or cherry picking or mm. things like this, because otherwise you open the Pandora's box, and it's nice to be participatory and inclusive, and I'm always in favor of that, but it's also easier on the people to know, okay, so what do you want from me? So that Angus can bring it out to ESO and say, this was what was discussed and reflected, mm -hmm. and this is the final outcome. Do we as ESO support it, or we just promote it? And the same goes to all the youth services and youth organizations in Ireland. This was discussed. Do you find it relevant? Use it in any way possible. Mm -hmm. I think that would be better to just have a final thing, but include the comments from the workshops. I just sent you an email about the things that we discussed in workshop number one, because there were very concrete modifications improvements suggested by the group and endorsed by the Opinion Boulevard. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing that I would like to see, that you kind of close it today or tomorrow, share it maybe with the people who are here, um, and then get the endorsement. I mean, I can tell you that from the u Forum perspective, we will share this as an outcome mm -hmm. in terms of giving it visibility, but I cannot sign up to that because we have our different internal procedures of how we agree on things, so we can promote it our name is there as a, a part of the event, and we are happy in this respect. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to discussing it politically, otherwise, then we have different procedures. So I will do what I can. Politically, I'm very much in favor, but I cannot put a dot on it in other ways. OK. No, that's very that's good to know, Peter. Thanks very much for that. Um, Patrick, behind you. Yeah, I'd like to follow on from that point. Um, it seems to me that this is an international event uh, hosted by Belong To and um, in, co in collaboration with the Irish Presidency and the Department. So it can be just that, a statement from this particular body, and I think to be a very strong and very welcome statement. I just wonder whether it should be called uh, principles, because th while there are principles in it, there, there's also very definite call to, calls to action, I as agree, it were. Yeah. Um, so I wondered something borrowing, we'll say, from the United Nations, a final declaration might not be the better way of describing it. We, we, we wanted like it to be called a declaration, but okay. the, there's, there's another declaration coming out as well. Ah, we've, uh, we've <laughs> declaration congestion this week. Uh, we have a roundtable in youth, uh, the contribution of youth work to youth employment. And from the ministry's perspective, we're planning to issue a declaration on that. So uh, that's why we differentiated. But uh, I, I think I accept your point. The idea of principles are somewhat aspirational, but what you're saying is that there's quite a few action-related yeah. uh, pieces in it. Yeah. And I think like statement or something beyond principles is a bit stronger as well, actually. So well, yeah. regardless of what it's called, it needs to grow out. It's really important. And congratulations, it's fantastic. Oh God, thanks very much, Patrick. Anybody else would like to contribute? This is really useful feedback, by the way. It's, it's really helpful. Ivan. Yeah, just briefly, uh, I would agree with what Peter said about that we need to wrap it up and, and, and send it out. My only um, concern is, and what I said uh, in my workshop, that uh, especially participation and then uh, rights part are not um, so uh, vocally human rights based. Like, th there is no human rights language which, was, which would I really much like to, to see in it because like especially if you're using that uh, before the states uh, we can refer it like on the several ways especially in that part but all, in all other ways we can refer it to international human rights instruments and when you're using that language the states are, are much more how to say it's much more clear to them what should they do or what should they be doing because it's, it's a part of their obligation not only mm. of our wishes they're obliged to do certain things. Ivan, can I suggest, would you, would you give us a hand in terms of re-phrasing uh, that, that section? Yeah, no problem. I was, yeah. I was already mentioning some, I was already giving some, some comments, but like, there would be like only minor, minor changes, but I think it would, be be, really it would be hard, it would be really important to, 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 to do those changes in it. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. Yes. Final point on the youth services part, because this is something we don't really, on the continent of Europe, allow me that phrase. Uh, we use youth organizations, and youth services don't always go hand in hand with youth organizations, and are sometimes in competition and are not very youth led. So, for us, uh, if you want to make it more international, it would be good to kind of 
make a reference to youth organizations. I understand the Irish context that you need to have youth services, but to kind of add youth organization as a yep. it would be helpful for the others. Absolutely. Otherwise, we are back in the game sure. of not yeah. understanding each other while we're actually speaking about the same thing. Yeah, okay. we hear you. Did you want to say something? If anybody else is moved to talk about any other issue that's relevant to today, you can, you can as well, by the way. Hi, just, to, just in terms of some of the things that came out of our group, and it has been mentioned, and Sophie um, recalled it there um, during her presentation, around cyberbullying and the challenges that that brings up, obviously, around social inclusion, but certainly in terms of access to education and barriers to education. And it's something that I think you know, potentially may, may need to be mentioned specifically um, as it is a, an issue that is gaining ground and is, is going to be a very difficult one to actually address fully. That was one, one area. And the other, um, in our group, it came out around actually separating out the visibility of trans, uh, trans young people and certainly gender identity uh, from a young age in terms of youth and education and in terms of providing appropriate age, uh, age appropriate um, educational materials and training for, uh, for teachers, um, but also that they could become available. And I thought that was a really important issue given the visibility um, difficulties for young trans people. So mm -hmm. I just want to put that out there. Great, thank you. And much. thanks for an amazing conference and learning experience. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, I suppose just maybe, sorry, Michael, just from a domestic point of view, uh, uh, for people from Ireland, uh, we'll be uh, developing our youth policy framework uh, once the presidency is over. Uh, so this will be an issue that will be, will be brought into that uh, policy domain as well. So just to reassure people that this is not, again, just an event, but that it's part of an ongoing process where we can build upon some sustainable wins. Michael, I have a question for you that is not related to the feedback session, but is related to what I mentioned in my speech about missing cue. Oh, yes, sure. Can about about queer. Yeah, no, it's not contentious at all, really. Um, it just depends on terminology. I, well, I personally, I think the missing letter is missing letter is I for intersex, actually, and I think we need to start using that. Um, I think when it comes to youth, queer can be a contentious word, though. I mean, uh, and it's still used as a, as a word that's uh, used in homophobic and transphobic bullying, so I would have some concerns over that. Q used in terms of questioning, maybe. Um, but again, I think it varies from context to context. But I certainly do think that we should be in Ireland be moving on to be saying LGBTI for sure. Yeah. Is that okay? <laughs> so I think we'll leave it at that, will we? I just want to wrap up just by saying a couple of thank yous. But before I do that, um, I'd just like to remind everybody that when in their packs they have an evaluation form. I have to admit that I'm the world's worst at filling out evaluation forms at the conferences and you end up going home with it in your bag. But we're, because we're finishing up a little bit early, maybe you'd take a couple of minutes just to fill it out now before you leave and then hand it in because the chances of you sending it back are probably pretty slim. So thank you very much for that. Um, oh. Evaluation form gets a, gets a uh, round of applause. Um, but I also just to say thank you, a few thank yous, um, and just to say as well that at the very beginning of the conference, I started by saying that I really hoped that um, what we were doing today was building on your commitment of all of you who have come from across Europe, um, from various organizations and institutions, and from across Ireland to come here today. Coming here today itself will demonstrate a huge commitment to the rights of LGBT young people. And I really hope, and I really do think that we look back on today as being a very significant moment in the progression of LGBT youth rights across Europe. So the thank yous are, I'd love to say thank you to the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, to Connor, to the Minister, and to everybody who has worked with us there. Um, I'm saying thank you to all the staff and belong to as well. Um, I got to say a few words up here, but behind the scenes there was a huge uh, number of staff and, well not a huge number of staff, but staff and a huge number of volunteers um, who put all of this together. I want to say thank you to the European Youth Forum, to Peter, to ILGA Europe, to IGLIO, to our international speakers particularly who came a long way to be here with us today, to Nevin who uh, spoke incredibly this morning, Nevin from Turkey, to Elijah from Glisten in the United States, uh, to Kocho, a uh, great friend uh, from Macedonia, uh, to George from Greece, to Thomas uh, from Lithuania, and to Kurtu from Finland, I think, is that right? Yeah. And also to Sophie and to um, Pascal. 
So I'd like to finish off today. I know a lot of you have seen this video already um, who were at the community forum last night, but we thought we'd just finish off uh, the session by showing off a small bit. No, but just because it's our, our 10th birthday, we said we'd give the second uh, viewing of it, our 10th birthday video, which was made for us by Hugh Rogers, Anna, uh, 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 sorry, Aoife and uh, Zlata, and to kind of just pats uh, or uh, shows what we've been doing over the last 10 years. So thank you very much. Belongtree was founded in 2003 under the understanding that we lived in an unjust society and that LGBT young people particularly were experiencing homophobia and transphobia um, in schools and families and communities and that we wanted to do something about it. There really was no place where LGBT young people could come together and discuss the issues which were affecting them. They were the first group I think that really brought young people into the equality agenda. In the early days we did get a fair bit of opposition and I think a lot of that was based on this two ideas. I think one was that, that young people couldn't be LGBT uh, at all. And then the other idea was that belong to us an organisation was somehow turning kids gay. It's never about telling a young person they're lesbian, gay or bisexual or transgender. It's giving them a safe and appropriate place and space where they can explore those issues themselves. To me, they're the most important group that has happened over the last few decades. When I was growing up, uh, the prevailing emotion for a gay person was fear. They had to be on the guard all the time in case the mask dropped and they gave themselves away. When it comes to the young people that we work with and did work with 10 years ago, they often get very negative messages about what it is to be gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender. And we wanted to kind of counteract that by presenting a really positive message to the world that it's completely normal to be LGBT. The peer support that comes from just meeting other lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender young people, uh, I don't think you can put a value on that. Just knowing that there's a group full of people like you, it's amazing. It made me feel like, you know, there's actually other people out there like me, you know, that understand me and that didn't judge me for, you know, like who I wanted to be with. Uh, regardless of what you felt from the outside world or what you felt in school or what you felt at home, it meant for one whole day you got to be you. Sometimes just like having a friend or someone to talk to is more important than, you know, the things like the legal or, or medical aspects of um, you know, being a member of the trans community. There used to be people that would travel close to six hours just to come to belong to for two hours, you know, just so they could feel normal and accepted. Now we're at a situation where we have a total of 23 groups running in 14 counties around the country. You know, a young person doesn't have to travel from Sligo now to come to Dublin to access an LGBT youth group. I think it's really important work. I think it saves lives actually, um, but not just about saving lives, it's about improving uh, the quality and the opportunities uh, for young people. We work on advocacy, we work on policy, we have campaigns like the Stand Up campaign. All that work is so that LGBT young people have different experiences when they're growing up. When you have people like the Minister for Education on the basis of work that belong to have done stand up and say they're going to produce a policy document on homophobic bullying, those kind of changes mean that Every school has to engage in this conversation and every school has to stand up, if you like, for these young people. If there were any highlight moments, it's really been around the, the whole stand-up campaign. When I was in secondary school in the first couple of years, it was actually illegal for a person to be, to be gay. There was no such thing in my school as a gay person. The only time you'd hear the word gay is they're talking about something in a negative way. Two years later, there's belong to posters all over the school, so like, it just keeps getting better. To see in the space of four years, the Stand Up campaign become a, a, an established annual part of the school calendar, you know, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have thought that was possible. For an organisation that's only had 10 years, I mean, the list of their achievements is quite spectacular. The work is not just referenced domestically, it's now being referenced internationally, and that's, that's an extraordinary acceleration of growth from the time I met them back in 2004. We 
have to keep in mind all of the young people out there who still are having a really hard time and what our work in the end of the day is about is getting to a point where no young person will have to go through that in this country. LGBT young people can have a huge impact on the world but in order for it to change in a very fundamental way we need everybody to take some level of responsibility. Solving these problems isn't just a good idea for LGBT young people, it, it's good for all young people and it's good for society in general. Having this support group and having hundreds of friends, like it shows you that you're not alone. It's the best thing that's happened to me since I came out. Thank you very much. <laughs>